Hey everyone, welcome back to the Women of the Word podcast. I'm Lauren and I'm here for a special bonus episode with my friend, Jen. Jen, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm so glad we get to do this. Yes, me too. Awesome. So over the course of the past few weeks, Jen, we've covered a lot of ground together about how to study God's word, topics from what Bible literacy is to different Bible study tools, and lots more in between. And even though we've discussed all of those things, we obviously weren't able to cover everything related to studying the Bible. So we've asked our listeners to send in any questions they might have had about things we've been discussing over the past few weeks, and they have answered. (laughs) So we received a lot of questions and we might not be able to answer all of them, but we're going to try to answer as many as we can today. So what do you say we dive in and answer some of the questions we've received? Awesome. Okay. So let's start with a few questions about reading through the Bible in general. So to start off, would you recommend that women read through the whole Bible once a year in addition to whatever Bible study they're doing? Well, a lot of that depends on how much time you have in your schedule. Uh, Obviously, there are stages of life where that may be more doable than others. I know a lot of people do make that a rhythm, and I think it's a great one. Uh, I would say more generally, yes, have a goal of reading through the Bible from start to finish. Um, Maybe at, at regular intervals is probably a better way to say it. So maybe that's every couple of years for you, or maybe it's Um, every three years, but to never have done it means that you're always going to be kind of trying to figure out where a particular portion of the Bible is fitting in the bigger story. So yeah, I think it's definitely important to do whether it's once a year or not. I think it depends a lot on your, your stage of life and your other commitments. Yeah, makes sense. So when it comes to reading through the Bible, we had a listener write in and ask where you recommend beginning Mm -hmm. when you start to read the Bible. Would you recommend people start in Genesis and kind of plug through? Would you start in the New Testament and then go to the Old? I think maybe the overall uh, question they're really trying to ask is what's your recommendation for someone who wants to become literate in the Bible, but is intimidated about where to start? Yeah. So I am actually, I would say the only method that for me personally does not work great is the one where you do a little in the Old Testament, a little in the New, and maybe dip into Psalms and Proverbs daily. If that's the the way that you're approaching it, to me, I'm not able to organize my thoughts the way that I want to around the flow of things because I'm jumping Mm -hmm. around too much. I'm not saying it doesn't work for everyone, but it has been the least helpful approach for for me personally. So I would say definitely start at the beginning, start in Genesis and get going. And I would say you can also try a chronological reading plan, which is one that would organize your reading in terms of the order in which things actually um, happen. So both of those are helpful approaches, but yes, start in Genesis and go all the way through to Revelation so that you can get a sense of, um, because there's a reason, honestly, that the books are in the order that they're in, in our Bibles. They're not haphazardly thrown in there. And before you start reading, it might be great for you to pay attention to that. Like we start with the law books and we move from there into the history books. And then you get, so they're in there in a, in a particular order for a particular reason when you're not doing chronological but both uh, both of those approaches can be helpful and you want to start at the beginning and go to the end as you would with any other book. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, maybe for those who are leading a Bible study and therefore choosing a study to do mm-hmm. with their group, how should they balance leading studies that talk about books of the Bible versus topical things and even line by line Bible studies? Yeah, this is a really good question and it does not have a one size fits all answer um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it might. So uh, what if you're the leader and you are looking at the landscape of what your church does offer and what your church has offered historically, it is important to ask, what have we done in order to ask, what should we do? And so there has to be a little bit of a diagnostic practice there. Uh, I would just say, so if you've done a lot of topical studies, you probably need to not do as many topical studies. It may be that you had a nice balanced approach all along and you can continue to offer sort of a mix of, of studies. But what my guess is, based on having done this for a while and been in a lot of local churches over the last 10 to 20 years, other than not just my own, um, is that what we're missing is the underlying just general knowledge of what these books say that is what brings to life a topical study. And so I think it would be a miss to 
to have years where you don't offer anything that is line by line because that is the gaping hole in people's understanding right now. Um, most people, most Christians I know have spent a lot of time in topical studies and they find line by line studies either boring or intimidating. Uh, they should find them to be neither of those things. So um, I would say as you consider what you're going to offer, if you're going to offer line by line studies, remember that you should be offering them in a way that demonstrates how important they are, um, and how exciting they are. Another listener wrote in and asked, I know that ideally I should be building my day around prayer and God, but I am newer to this concept and finding Bible study time very hard to fit into my day. I know that's not how I should look at it, but that's how I feel and it's hard. I feel a pull to learn more about God, but I'm not sure how to get it all done with a full life of work, family, and all the kids things. <laughs> Yeah, I can't relate to that at all. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, this woman is all of us. Can we just say that? Right. Um, yes. Yeah, I think we all feel that. And I do think we have been told that you have to have a daily, we call it a quiet time. You have to have a daily quiet time. Otherwise, you're failing. And I would want to push back on that. I do think that we need a regular practice because we... Uh, like everything, um, disciplines require rhythms in order for us to be able to execute them faithfully. And um, that word discipline is closely related to that word disciple. So we would expect that we would have some some rhythm to, to what we're doing. I would say the more important thing to pay attention to is your desire. Uh, desire is what drives discipline. And so if you're feeling a desire to know more and to spend more time in study, ask the Lord to increase it. And then ask him to show you how to implement good rhythms into your current stage of life and do what you're doing. Talk to other women who, who do have various practices. Be aware that there isn't just one way to do this. Like uh, I have, I think I've been pretty open about this. I have never had a practice of a daily quiet time in the morning, never. And I don't think I ever will. Uh, and yet I have found time to study and learn and grow and have devotional time. And so um, just be aware that you can fit this into your own personality, your own scheduling needs, that there are rhythm um, elements to it and there are accountability elements to it. Don't just try to do it on your own. Have, have spaces where other people are meeting with you in this practice so that you have the accountability of that to, to help keep you on course. Yeah, not a one size fits all kind That's of right. thing, but yeah, important for everyone to fit mm -hmm. it in how they can in their stage mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's move on to a few different questions about the CIA, the comprehension, interpretation, application mm -hmm. uh, aspect of studying the Bible. So we had another listener write in and ask, how can we accurately inform ourselves about the cultural context of a passage so we can discern correct and incorrect portrayals of that cultural context? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, it's important to remember that depending on what kind of reading you're doing, it may be more or less important um, for you to identify the, the cultural context. So it's always going to be important to a degree. But if you're reading the Psalms, for example, it may not be as important as if you are reading the Gospels or another historical narrative. And so if you're in the history books, you do want to pay particular attention. But at any time that you are in a book of the Bible and you're reading something and you are utterly confused, you might want to ask, am I missing something culturally? And then start trying to look and see what you can find. But um, it is true. We actually were talking about this a little before we started recording that not every commentary gives the same degree of attention to cultural context as um, as, as another one might. And so you do want to sort of begin to build up a sense of who's going to talk about this in their commentaries. And so I thought it might be helpful for you guys to see some of the places that have been helpful for me, depending on where I am in the scriptures. So like, this is a big book, but I think it's worth, worth the investment if you're, or, you know, ask for it for your birthday. Um, yeah. this is, this is Bruce Waltke's Theology of the Old Testament. He's going to give some attention to cultural context issues, but just generally speaking, he's going to give you a broad sweeping understanding of the Old Testament. I do find the Old Testament is where people get the most intimidated by the, the cultural aspect of things. So any, yeah. any study Bible will give you some sense of this. 
Um, but when you're like, that was a little, but I want a lot, you need to go and start looking somewhere else. So Walt Key is a good place to look. When I put together the Genesis study that I wrote, um, this Bill Arnold was a, was a big help to me. His encountering, and I think it's over more than just the book of Genesis, but it's, it's, it is an, it is purposefully focusing on cultural pieces as it's exploring how to understand the, the interpretation and application of the text. Um, another one, this, this whole series I think is good. It's the For You commentary series. It's written at a lay level and by names you recognize and often pays a lot of attention to cultural um, contexts to help the average learner, which I include myself in that. And then here's one that's been helpful to me in the New Testament as you study um, Christ is Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes. So those are just some examples of places that you might go. And what you can do is read the footnotes of those people when you find helpful information. And then you that usually will lead you to other helpful sources. Um, and then also just bear in mind, I've just recommended four books to you that I have used dipping in and dipping out. And so no one ever recommends a book like this saying here, every single thing in here is something I would agree with or you would find useful. But um, that's also a really important part of building your understanding of how to study the scriptures is I don't have to agree with every single thing in this book for it to be helpful to me. Yeah, that's really helpful. Sometimes I think people get a little leery about that of like, well, what if what if not everything in here is something that yeah. I can put my stamp of approval on that doesn't negate some of the things that mm -hmm. that are helpful in them. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Another question from a listener. They said, on days when your Bible study is more studious, so when you're doing more of the comprehension work of looking up definitions and all of those kinds of things, what other things do you do to maintain the relationship aspects of time with the Lord? Yeah, I get various versions of this question a lot, and um, I don't mean to be obtuse. I just don't, I don't understand the question always. I, I think that the implication is that study is not relational, um, and I do not find it to be that way. Study is not cold and dry for me. Study is a means of relationship. And so um, if I'm looking to feel a particular way when I study, I can understand how that can feel less relational, um, but I do not see it as being removed from the relational aspect of my um getting to know the Lord. And so um, I think that's something that develops over time, though, because when you first begin to develop sort of a study method and a study habit, there are so many mechanical aspects to it that don't feel comfortable. And the more you grow in your comfort of just utilizing a practice, the more you have a, a, a sort of a shorter distance between the work you're doing and the way it changes the way that you think and feel. Yeah, makes sense. I know that can kind of be um, a hard thing too for women in particular studying the Bible. It's, mm -hmm. well, if I don't feel a certain way or if I'm not it doing didn't what work. I think. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's encouraging to remember that all of our study of the Lord is also building that relationship right. with him, even if it's not all devotional in nature. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. A question for you about genres. Would you say that epistles are considered a specific genre? Yes. Not only would I say that, pretty much everybody would say that. So <laughs> that tells me that I didn't say something clearly in the original podcast because, yes, right. epistles are a genre. Uh, a letter is a style of writing, right? An epistle is a fancy mm -hmm. word for letter. And so um, letters abide by particular rules. They have an opening. They have, you know, a greeting that he typically gives thanks. He uh, then moves into... Um, Typically in the New Testament epistles, we see, you know, uh, this is who you are and then a shift to this is therefore how you should live. And then there are final greetings and all of that. So absolutely, uh, those letters are abiding by particular genre rules. And those are actually intuitive rules for most of us. It's it, I, I've often said that that's the most intuitive genre we can study because we ourselves have written letters. And so we know how they go. And it's how we understand um, some of the differences in the way that you might look at the uh, epistle of Hebrews versus, say, the epistle of um, Ephesians, because Hebrews does not follow all of the typical rules of, of a letter. It's more like a sermon. So that's a small difference, but it's a difference that can change the way we think about how it might have been utilized when it was originally brought into a church setting. So yes, absolutely, um, epistles are a genre. 
Great awesome. question. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited about your answer to this next question because I think I have also had this question myself. Mm -hmm. So can you describe the difference between speculating about a text and then drawing appropriate conclusions from a text? What's yeah, the this, difference between that? This is that? very important. And, uh, and in fact, um, I, I, get a, I get versions of this question as well, um, because in, in my Bible studies, I will always say, what do you think Paul means? Or what do you think Moses means when he says X, Y, or Z or whatever? And uh, people just go nuts. They're like, I don't want to tell you what I think. I just need to know what it means. And, um, <laughs> and so that speculative aspect and, and the idea that we might speculate about anything in the scriptures is just to some people feels like, ah, oh, that's out of control. I'm going to say something wrong or think something wrong. And the purpose of that speculation stage is not so that you can necessarily arrive at a right answer in the moment so much as it is that you can recognize what where you currently are in your understanding. Um, we can't know what we need to know until we acknowledge what we think we already know. So, so it's that when I say, what do you think? What I'm saying is take a crack at it, but then we're going to, we're going to come up with some good answers to what it, what you should have said. Uh, but I think a lot of people don't recognize that in the learning process, part of the learning process is simply saying out loud where you currently are in your understanding with the acknowledgement that your understanding is not complete and is still forming. So, um, it is important to move from that place to where we begin to draw better conclusions. And the reason that God gifts some of us to be teachers is because we're a little further ahead of you on that understanding curve than you are. It doesn't mean that you're failing. It means that you're maturing. And so part of being able to mature is to say, this is what I think. I don't know if it's right or not. And then having done that exercise, you will listen with a more uh, critical ear. And I mean critical in the sense of discerning ear to what other people are telling you is what it means when you get to that stage of the process. Like going back to what we were just talking about, not every book has uh, has stuff in it that we would agree with. Um, yeah. One of the one of the key elements of recognizing that you are thinking critically as you're going through the learning process is that you disagree with what you hear sometimes, um, and that's a scary feeling for us because we're like, well, if a Bible teacher says it and they love God and they're opening the scriptures, I should always agree with them. Um, but that's just simply not the way that it goes. Um, we have to have our own knowledge of the text. We have to discuss it in conversation with others and we have to sit under good teaching. And then we ask the Lord to grant us light. It's a process. Yeah, definitely. Really helpful. So when a passage in the Old Testament is foreshadowing of the Messiah, say yeah. Psalm 22, for example, okay. what should be the primary interpretation when we study? So should it be what the original readers understood it to be? Or should it be through the lens of Jesus and his work on the cross? Or did the original readers understand it as foreshadowing the Messiah? This is a really, I love the questions we got were so great. It was encouraging <laughs> sure, to me that we got good questions because I'm like, that means people are really thinking. Uh, yes. So I kind of just want to answer this with, yeah, uh, but that's not right. probably not the most helpful answer. <laughs> um, so the way we think about those levels of interpretation, so what it meant for them and for then, what it means for us and for always, what it means for me and for now, um, you can't have no sense of what it meant for them and for then, even if you are looking backward toward the work of Christ on the cross, right? So um, I would say, yeah, we do want to see, we will see how this foreshadowed Christ because we have the full disclosure of God's plan that they did not have. So no, when when Psalm 22 is being written, is it being written with an, did, 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 did David think, um, I know I'm describing what's going to happen to Christ. No, I, I would argue he probably didn't even know it was a messianic statement that he's making. I think he was describing his own suffering, uh, yeah. frankly. Um, but because he's a type of Christ, we can look back and see, oh, this is how David's words were um, foreshadowing Christ. Not only that, but Christ himself employs, you know, David's David's writing. He knew, he, he knew exactly, obviously, how it pointed toward him. And so he helps us to see how those fit together. Um, but it is important to recognize that, uh, like now you can see one of the interpretations we can take is that if David suffered as Christ would suffer, then we also should expect that we will suffer as Christ suffered. 
um, and it can help inform a theology of suffering for us. So it's not simply, I don't like it when people say, and see, Christ fulfills this. So there's our interpretation, so move on, because I do think there's more there than that. That is a lot, that is a wealth, but there is more there. So um, yes, we should look at it with New Testament eyes, uh, but looking at it with New Testament eyes does not mean that we skip the the part where we look at it with Old Testament eyes. Those two things should talk to each other. Um, they should make sense of each other. Jen, can you actually describe for listeners again what those three levels of application are? It's for them and for then, for yeah. us and for always. So in other words, what does this? What significance does this have for the church of all time, for the great cloud of witnesses? Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, for me and for now, when we talk about uh, levels of application, so often the only way we've been taught to think about application is for me and for now. So what I like to push students to do is start with for them and for then. What was their application of this? So when 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 Old Testament believers um, sang or read Psalm 22, what did it mean to them? Because that matters. And then knowing how Christ shows us what the fuller or bigger meaning was, how does that serve the church of all time? And then lastly, does it have a personal meaning for me? Am I currently in a time where I'm hard pressed and downtrodden? How can I look to the example of Christ uh, in the words of David and understand my suffering differently? So another question that we had for you was when and how should listeners or other people listening encourage their kids to study the Bible? I think they're wondering, should they start their children on the CIA, this comprehension, interpretation, application? What would you recommend when teaching your children the Bible? Where to begin? Oh, absolutely. What's what's ironic is I think we actually know to do this with the other books they're reading. We just forget to do it with the Bible. So um, in the same way that you might read Charlotte's Web with your children and have conversations about what actually happened and about what the meaning of that book is and how we might think differently about human relationships as a result of the way that Charlotte sacrificially lives her life. Like, think about that book. It is a, it's, Charlotte is a, is a Christ figure in the book, right? And so, um, the w- same way that you would talk about a book like that, that's probably a little too on the nose because that book is definitely working on that <laughs> that that theme. Sure. But maybe it's a great example for that reason. Uh, we should yeah. be talking about the Bible the same way. I, I think that we think it devalues the Bible to make the statement the Bible is literature. I actually think that it elevates the Bible um, and causes us to treat it with at least the same respect we would treat any other book. And so um, give your children the gift of being able to read and and understand and apply the Bible the same way that they might read and understand and apply any other morality tale. And children's books are filled with morality tales. So give them the same skills that you're using um, with other books that you'll be talking about actively with them. And if you're thinking, I don't really talk with them actively about other books, then I would just add an addendum here and say, do that. Like have (laughs) all kinds of book clubs with your kids. So that, because all, all great stories, all stories that have a lasting impact on us are echoes of the one true story. And so um, as you are learning and growing in your understanding of the one true story, give your children the gift of being able to recognize it where it is in the other books that they'll be reading. And you will, I think, find that your conversations are avid around this. Like, I wish you could see behind me are all my theology books. In mm-hmm. front of me are all of the books that we read with our kids through the years. I, they're, they, they go up and around the window um, that yeah. I'm sitting in front of. And so um, this is this Bible literacy is a subset of literacy. And so if you want to have children who are avid learners and readers of scripture, be sure that you're investing in them being avid learners in general. We had another listener write in and ask, how can you stay focused on what the Bible is saying about God when reading passages that mention him very little? This is a really good question. When I saw it, when you sent them over, uh, yeah. spoiler alert, I do read them before we get on here, or most of them. Um, I love this question because it's, it's important. Um, first of all, there are entire chapters in Genesis or in the book of Judges where we hear, in other books, those are just examples, where... Um, 
God drops out of the text. Like you just don't hear uh, anything about him. And um, that is something we should be paying attention to. We should say, why am I not hearing anything about God here? Because the author is doing that on purpose. It is intended to communicate something. It does not mean that God is not active. It means God is, it usually means God is letting humans act like fools and then he's going to show up again. And so um, what do we learn about a silent God? That's an important thing for us to ask. Does it mean he's unfaithful? Does it mean that he's not paying attention? It means none of those things, right? And so those are good things to meditate on. But then there are other books, other genres in which we would not expect that we would hear um, about God, like Proverbs, for example. You'll hear a lot of wisdom principles, but they may not explicitly refer to God in a particular proverb. And so then we need to ask the question, how are we seeing the character of God? Uh, you know, how do we see the wisdom of God in this wisdom statement? What do we learn is true about God? So um, let me think if I can think of a, a good example. What's a proverb that comes to mind for you? Uh, uh, answer not a fool according to his folly would be one. Uh, and then the next one is answer a fool according to his folly, right? And so it's like, yeah. oh, which one are we supposed to do? Um, <laughs> and so what we're seeing there is that in, in God's wisdom economy, um, wisdom is situational. It depends on which fool and what kind of um, folly is going on, whether you would answer or not answer. And so pay attention. And isn't this exactly what we see the Lord do in the way that he interacts with people in the scriptures and in our own lives? We know that there are times where he responds to us in our folly. And there are times where, as we just saw, he backs off and lets us live in the silence and learn the lesson the hard way. So, um, it is, there is always a way to think back to what is true about God. Um, God is explicitly present in some portions of scripture more than others. And I love that this woman was paying attention to that and asking a really insightful question about it. Okay, Jen, let's transition now to a few questions specifically for Bible teachers. So how do you use the CIA, that comprehension interpretation application, if the education level of those in your group lacks the level necessary to implement those skills. Mm -hmm. I think what this person is trying to ask is they don't want their Bible study to turn into a class. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, why not? <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, classes are where we learn things. And that's funny because uh, I I find this is a, a, a fairly pervasive um, thought that a classroom is boring and um, I always say there's no school like the old school, like the way that you've learned things that were meaningful to you and useful to you was usually in a classroom. And so don't shy away from that. I, I do think that we can feel that way because of the heavy uh, approach, devotional approach that a lot of us have, have been sort of um, trained into. But you do actually want it to feel like a class. And initially, they may not love it. Uh, they will not be accustomed to it. And so that's why it's really important to set a clear expectation up front. Hey, this is going to be different than what you've done before, but I'm going to ask you to trust the process. And I think what you will find on the other side of it is that it was useful and that you do have the feelings to go with the practice, but you will not have them immediately. That's why anytime I start at the beginning of a Bible study, I tell people have a long-term view, like take a, let the process take its time. And so, um, with regard to different education levels, though, this is a valid concern, which is why I personally try to teach all of my studies at an eighth grade reading level, because most people in our church will have that ability. And then you will have people who are further along. And so the next concern I will hear is, well, if I teach at an eighth grade reading level, aren't the people who are further along in their understanding going to get bored? And uh, I do not find this to be the case. That's what I love about the Bible study space is I think it's an equalizer in the, in the sense that everyone has somewhere to grow in that space. And so whereas someone who has studied the Bible longer may find things like marking a repeated word or phrase to be uh, less interesting or they just may be quicker at it than someone who hasn't done it before, it is still benefiting them. And then when we get to the interpretation 
phase and the application phase? Well, because the Word of God is indeed living and active, there's always more there for the person who has been doing this longer. Not only that, but the person who's been doing this longer, if indeed they have been maturing in their faith, they understand the importance of being a co-learner with someone who is not as far along as they are, and they understand that role to be one of being an encouragement and a help to those who are coming along behind in a way that even the teacher won't be, because the teacher's always perceived to be so much further along, whether she is or not. So um, I do think it's an important concern to articulate. I think in practice, it is not that great of a concern if you have it in view and you are paying attention to the dynamics of the group and making sure that no one gets left behind and that everyone has something to challenge them. Yeah. Maybe just a follow-up to that question. How would you say, how can how can teachers, Bible study mm-hmm. teachers, make their study approachable for women of all maturity levels mm-hmm. so that the people that are more spiritually mature are challenged, but those younger in their faith aren't overwhelmed? Mm-hmm. And you spoke to that a little bit. Would you have anything else that you'd like to say uh, to that end? Uh, yeah. So I would say that the most valuable teaching experience that I got was the one that I valued the least at the time, and that was when I taught seventh grade girls Sunday school. And so if you want to be effective in teaching adults, there's really no better lab for learning those skills than teaching in children's ministry or student ministry. I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't have time to do that. Uh, And that may be fair. You may not. Although I'll tell you what, your children's ministry and student ministry would fall over if you showed up and said you wanted to help. Uh, So if you have enough of a timeline, I would say spend some time learning how to take deep truth and communicate it in simple terms, because that is the skill. That is what makes uh, effective teaching happen at every level. And we never outgrow it. Our listeners never outgrow it. Um, So even if you don't have time to actually spend time teaching in a space like that, it might be helpful to you to listen to um, teachings that are recorded and available um, that are geared toward children or middle schoolers so that you can begin to get into that headspace. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but I I can't overstate uh, how it has impacted my teaching approach. Mm, Yeah, really helpful. Good idea. Um, Another listener wrote in and asked, they said, I've been interested in leading a women's Bible study at my church for a couple of years now, but have always been hesitant because I don't think teaching is one of my spiritual gifts. I love the way the study of the word has changed me and want to share what I've learned, but also worry that teaching should be left to those who are gifted in that area. What are your thoughts? (laughs) So what are your thoughts, Jen? (laughs) Uh, Well, you won't know until you try. And uh, don't ever assume that your interest isn't telling you something about your gifting. Uh, Very few of us have a a deep interest or impulse to pursue something that isn't a gift. And I think sometimes we took a a diagnostic test at some point that was supposed to tell us what our spiritual gifts were. And we're like, well, that's my list from now on for forever. And I'm not saying (laughs) that this listener necessarily did that. But... um, But I do think that in many cases, the gifting that I now know is mine to give to the church is something that I see in hindsight that I did not see uh, uh, on the on the on the beginning side of things. And so uh, you never know until you try and just have honest people around you who will give you feedback and say, hey, that was a great try this may not be your thing, you know, or they're going to say, Hey, I actually see something in you that I think is going to grow into something that's going to feel more comfortable as you go. And I want to help you get there, but you won't know until you try. I do think it is important to pay attention to that desire that's in you because it's either pointing you toward a gift that you do have and you're not aware of, or it's pointing you toward an area of service where the gifts you do have will will have some teaching element to them. And, and, and if you don't explore it, it's going to take you longer to get into that space than it might otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something that you have to be a hundred percent certain about before you can even take, take that the first, first step. step. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So outside of the five P's of transformational Bible study that we talked about in one of our previous episodes, what other steps can teachers take to ensure they don't unintentionally teach error? 
Well, we had that additional P that was study with people, the little sixth free P right. that we throw in there. Yeah. Uh, and that one, I think it can sometimes, I think the way actually that I talked about in the women of the word was, was pretty brief. And so you can think that what is entailed there is just, oh, I need to gather with other people and talk about the Bible. But one of the shared spaces for talking about the Bible is the historic conversation of the Christian church. And so I would say if you're concerned about teaching error, you will, you will be a much more conscientious uh, and confident Bible teacher if you have attempted to learn basic doctrines of the Christian faith. And so I'm talking about systematic theology. Uh, that's a big, scary word that doesn't need to be, but you should be learning what is the doctrine of God? What is the doctrine of man? What is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, of Christ, of the Father? So, you know, you, and you walk through all that. What's the doctrine of the church? So really, basically, it's what the Apostles' Creed runs through in, in very brief statements. And um, you need those lenses to be able to be confident in your teaching of scripture because what they're telling you is historically this is what Christians have all affirmed for over 2,000 years um, as the guardrails through which we understand the teachings of scripture. Um, they can feel to the new learner like, well, aren't these extra biblical? Uh, but they're not extra biblical. They are, I think of them as organizer bins for what's in the Bible. So in the same way that you might organize your closet or your pantry, they help organize um, the most essential teachings of the scripture that have been agreed upon as orthodox for 2000 years into um, ways that we can understand and remember them. So yes, I would say doctrine. Gathering with other people, meaning the, the people who have gone before us in our faith, the people who are currently in conversation in our faith, uh, who have shared an understanding of Christianity together, um, is essential to um, proper teaching of scripture. And you will feel so much relief knowing, oh, I'm teaching according to the same uh, guidelines that Tim Keller taught according to, or um, that uh, Martin Luther taught according to. So those, that's what doctrine can help us with and so much more. If we're going to do a Bible study with other people, what questions about the passage that we're studying should we ask ourselves prior to, prior to meeting with other people? So what questions should we ask on our own? And which questions about our passage should we ask in a group setting? Or the, is there a difference between as I'm doing the prep work on my mm -hmm. own that I should ask myself mm -hmm. versus the questions I should ask when I'm studying that passage with a group? Mm -hmm. So my hope would be that the group has questions that you are also working from to build the teaching before you get together to have a discussion. So when I say teaching, it may be, you know, if you're in a group of 12, you may not be lecture style teaching. In fact, I would argue you probably shouldn't be. It should be a conversation around questions that they worked on before they got there um, that forced them to examine comprehension, interpretation, and application that then they discuss in the group. So this is the three-legged stool of learning that I often will reference. So the work they do on their own then comes into the group and is discussed in the group. And then the teaching time is the third leg that helps to resolve any dissonance that might still exist uh, with regard to the questions they were asked to do beforehand. So on the one hand, you should be looking at the same questions that they are looking at before the discussion happens. On the other hand, you should be asking some additional questions. Those questions are related to the questions that you have given to the group before you get there. And those questions are, which of the questions that I gave them to prepare, did they think had an easy answer, but there was actually much more to it because that's something we're gonna need to explore. Uh, and then the second question typically that I use to frame up where I'm gonna let the discussion or the teaching go is, um, which of the questions that I gave them sent them into a soul-sucking spiral of doubt uh, or caused them to panic and feel dumb, you know, those kinds of things because we're absolutely going to talk about those. And so um, as the leader or teacher in that setting, you do have a responsibility to anticipate how they answered the questions that you gave them and then steer them toward a good answer or a good way to answer. That's helpful. So in a sense, you're kind of using this the questions that people had as homework, in a sense, yes. mm -hmm. as your starting point for questions that you can ask. 
in a group yeah. setting. Oh, I would say they're, they're not just the starting point. They are what the, what the group time the together should be because you want yeah. them to connect that work that they've done on their own to, to a meaningful understanding of the text. Otherwise it's busy work. Right. And so right. when I'm coaching women on how to start teaching and how to be an effective Bible teacher, um, the homework piece that work on your own piece is essential to that because um, a successful teaching is not whether you started with a compelling illustration that made them laugh and ended with a compelling illustration that made them cry and they learned some things in the middle. It's did you teach to the work that they did on their own? And so a baseline solid teaching is I recognize the work that you did before you got here. And I know that you came in here. If the, if the questions you gave them were good, you came in here with dissonance. You have a good sense of what you want to know and you don't know yet. And now we're going to work together to resolve that dissonance in a way that causes this, this passage to stick with you. And I will just say that's one of the biggest misses in curriculum writing. I wish we, we probably could have done a whole episode on curriculum writing, um, is that Often the questions we've been given to do before the gathering time uh, don't create any dissonance at all. They they don't cause us to think, oh, I don't I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we feel like we answered them correctly and we're going to get straight A's on our homework. Or if the answer is difficult, I just read a little further down and they will give me the answer. And so, again, the questions that we should be giving these comprehension interpretation uh, and application questions should should be challenging to them. They should have a hard time answering uh, some of them, not all of them, so that they come eager to hear what's going to happen in the discussion and teaching time. Yeah, super helpful. Why is it important for women to have their own space to study the Bible together within the church? Oh, I love this question. Um, it is important for a couple of reasons. One is because if we're learning the scriptures in a way that is transforming not just our thinking, but our, um, our will and our actions, it means that it will lead to confession and vulnerability. And I think any woman who's done ministry in all female spaces for any period of time knows that there is a level of vulnerability that will only happen in a single gender setting. So I like to remind people that I do not mean that all we should do is have single gender spaces, nor do I think that all we should do is have mixed gender spaces. I think it's a both and, but I do think that the Bible study space particularly lends itself to single gender, to all female um, gathering spaces, uh, because it enables women to feel comfortable uh, with being vulnerable about what's really going on in their lives. But here's another thing it, it enables them to be comfortable with. It enables them to be comfortable with having a thought level discussion in a way that they might not be in a mixed gender setting. So I just want to unpack that a little bit. Yeah. Um, because there are some social penalties sometimes in churches for women who enter conversations at the thought level. It means that we have in many t cases been socialized into being uh, quieter in, in mixed gender spaces or only entering into those conversations at the feelings level. Um, I'm not actually dinging the church for this, although I don't think it's great. This is something that is uh, recognizable sociologically in any mixed group. Men tend to offer twice as many answers as women. They tend to enter in at the thought level and women tend to enter in at the feelings level. A single gender space is often the first place that a woman will take a risk on saying what she thinks. And so that's why I love uh, all female groups. Um, there are some other reasons, but that's my short answer for now. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with that mm -hmm. um, in their own lives and experiences as well. So that was really helpful. Okay, let's end just with a few questions, uh, Jen, for you. So our listeners had just a few questions. Yeah, just for you. So what would you say is your favorite Bible study that you've either written or done? This is like asking me which of my children is my favorite. <laughs> um, I would say... My favorite, it, 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 it moves around a little bit, kind of based on where I've spent the most time recently. I'd say my favorite thus far is probably the Exodus study. I would have said the Genesis study before I revisited the Exodus study. Uh, but those old, those two Old Testament studies at the beginning of the Bible that are, in my view, and it's not just in my view, Genesis and Exodus 
are critical to our understanding of the Bible as a whole. And so those two books helped me understand the rest of the Bible so much better um, that I have just thoroughly enjoyed um, going back to them again and again. Yeah, so I love those. Um, and then I will at some point publish a study that I taught years ago on the book of Judges, which also mattered a lot to my understanding of the Bible as a whole because it does, you cannot, the number of difficult things you have to talk about in the book of Judges is vast. Yeah. And um, so a lot of those sort of low level fears that I think women in particular carry about, you know, does God actually love women or are we second class citizens? Um, like we might know, you know, I know he loves us as much as he loves men, but then you read some of these things in the Bible and you're like, but does he? And so um, that book of Judges made me stare down a lot of things that I had not had to uh, wrestle with personally and certainly had not had to stand up and teach to a group of women. And so at some point that will become available again. And um, I'm eager for, for women to learn um, in a deeper way that God does indeed. Uh, love all of his image bearers. What are some of your favorite commentaries that you like to use for deeper study after having done your own study? Or what have been some books other than the Bible that have helped shape your study of the Bible? Um, yeah, those are two different questions. So the, the commentary one, I think I've talked about this, but just quickly, I'll just say again, I will start with a commentary. You know, you, you're kind of reading along and you're like, oh, this one's boring or, oh, I'm really getting a lot out of this one. And when I get to that, oh, I'm really getting a lot out of this one, I start reading the footnotes of whoever um, they used to build what they're doing. And so a starting point for me that's been pretty helpful are the Life Change series by NavPress. Do I was seeing if I could grab one. I'm not going to reach behind me and grab everything off my shelf right okay. now. I know I want to. Uh, but the Life Change series, their, their um, footnotes, their bibliographies are, are generally helpful starting points for those of us who are not perhaps formally theologically trained, so accessible. Um, and I start with accessible and then I, because, you know, footnotes are going to move you toward more scholarly things the deeper you dig. Yeah. Um, but I love James Montgomery Boyce. Um, I love... Um, uh, that For You series that I've shown you uh, earlier is a, is a good one, very accessible. And the people who are writing them are people who are using just right down the middle sources. They're not going to take you anywhere, you know, risky with their footnotes. Um, and so really it's a, you learn by feel though. You really have to feel your way forward in that process and give yourself time. Um, and then the second one, which books have most impacted my study of the Bible? The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozier hands down, followed closely by Stephen Charnock's The Existence and Attributes of God, which Tozier was, I found in Tozier's footnotes. So um, I just, no one had, no one had presented the Bible to me, or maybe I didn't hear them do so, but I, I did not understand the Bible to be a book about God until I was given a vision of God high and lifted up in the knowledge of the Holy. So that's why the doctrine of God matters so much to me as someone who wants people to love the Bible. If the Bible is simply about me or how to live my life better, um, I could put it on the bookshelf next to a bunch of books that are not divinely inspired and it would be about equally useful, but it's about so much more. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for sharing those resources with us. Yeah. So I know, I'm sure most of our listeners know that you're a mom, but maybe some don't know that you're also now a grandmother. Yes. So the last question we have for you today is how are you planning to encourage your three grandchildren to study God's word when they're a bit older? And what is your prayer for them as they grow and learn God's word? Well, first of all, I don't want to encourage my three grandchildren. I want to encourage my 45 grandchildren, uh, but I do only currently have three. So we'll go with those three. Uh, I'm like, let's just be a dynasty, shall we? Uh, can we yes. call ourselves a dynasty yet if there's only three of them? Uh, but um, so uh, really the, I know, I know that parents and grandparents want the answer to this to be, I'm going to give them a good practice. And I'm going to tell them that they should do it and I'm going to make sure they're disciplined or whatever. Uh, the most effective way for a child to want to love the scriptures is for them to witness your evident and undeniable love of the scriptures. And so what my prayer is, is that I would show them that in the way that I live my life. And so when they think about sugar, which is the name of my choosing. Uh, when they think about sugar, they will think she loved the scriptures because they helped her love the Lord. 
And, um, you know, I know most parents and grandparents are familiar with the words in Deuteronomy 6 about talk about these things. And I talk about them at every juncture of the day is essentially the way to sum that up. And I think we think that means um, show them how to do a word study. And I'm not saying it doesn't mean that, but it means that we're constantly talking about um, what happened with a friend and um, how would how would Christ respond? Or um, what do you think about that in terms of like you being someone who loves the Lord and maybe they don't even know him, you know? And so uh, I think we've underestimated the power of a thousand small conversations and overestimated the effectiveness of one big one uh, in so many ways. Uh, you can think about the various topics that parents feel anxious about. Um, I can think of two. One is talking about sex and the other is talking about faith. Um, and in both of those cases, I would say it's a thousand small conversations that does the good work of formation. And so trust that those conversations will do that work and then um, have relationships that are structured around a thousand conversations. And you can imagine there are great implications for that. that that's going to that's going to implicate your calendar significantly, the things you're going to commit time to. Um, because those thousand conversations are organic and we don't get to say when they happen. And that means we have to have a great deal of availability. So that's what I pray that my children and my grandchildren will think when they remember me when I have gone to dust. And that is, um, man, she had time for us and we had a thousand conversations. And I know why she loved the Lord and I know how she loved the Lord. And I, I want to do the same. Yeah, that's a good word. Thanks so much, Jen, for sharing all you've learned and your insights with us. It's been so helpful. And thanks to all of you who submitted a question for our show today. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you're listening so you can catch up on all the previous episodes of the show. And thanks for tuning in to the Women of the Word podcast. 